please welcome Johannes. Curtis, thank you very much. In Kosi Kakulu Baba, I'm from South Africa, and the language that we speak is Germany. Uh, and, and he'd read from the Bible, and he'd preamble this by saying, unfortunately, he couldn't find anything in the Bible about computers. Now, it would be politically incorrect of me to say, well, actually, there is a little passage in uh, the end of the Bible at Revelations that says, calculate the number of the beast, uh, which is 666. But given that I was supposed to be in favor of computers, that would have been an incorrect way to go. So I've been trained not to talk about sex, religion, and politics, so I thought I'd come the closest to that, and that would be to speak about Shakespeare. So to put, um, because that's all three, really. So to put all that in context, um, what, what I did was, my, the first speaker at this conference spoke, um, gave a sort of a future glance, the first keynote. The second keynote gave a historic view. And what I'm looking at is a sort of a history repeats itself view, because it would seem to me that every time a new technology gets introduced, we go through exactly the same phase or set of phases. And so what I've done is I've, I've put this, sort of set it to music as it were, put it to Shakespeare's seven ages of man, which I guess we should now call seven ages of person. Um, but I've also put it on, slide, on, on every slide because I'd like you to respond to some of the things that we're doing there. Um, so the seven ages uh, of Shakespeare's seven ages of man says, uh, all the world's a stage and all the men and women nearly, merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. First the infant, then the whining schoolboy, then the lover, then a sh soldier, then the justice, into the lean and slippered pantaloon, and then second childishness and mere oblivion. And so, so I know there are many implementation models and e-maturity models and so on, but I found that you can see these seven stages going through various places, and I'd like you as we go along to see how those apply possibly to the area where you are. Just a, by a show of hands, how many of you are in and are on the same slide as I am? Oh, very good. I should take a picture back at you. And the other thing is that you may want to uh, also flip around to Twitter, and if you'd like to participate um, and you are too shy, then why not tweet what you're saying? Because then nobody else will know except the whole world. Uh, so um, you might want to tweet in response because at the end I'll log into Twitter and I will go and look for some of the hashtags. We hashtag eLearn2014. I look for that and we can make some comments. So we start. And there is a picture that I managed to Google on the seven ages. Disclaimer, ladies and gentlemen, none of the images here are my own. They're everything that I stole somewhere on the internet. Um, next disclaimer, I made this PowerPoint long before plagiarism was invented. You will know that plagiarism was only invented approximately when Turnitin was uh, hit the scene, isn't it? Before that, there was no plagiarism. Um, but if you need to find out what it is, you copy that into Google Images, into the search bar, and it will take you to the image anyway. And so the context that we've got is that actually we've been doing the same stuff year after year after year. We've just been calling it different things. We still have floppy disks, we still have main storage units, uh, we still have input, we still have processes, output, we still have leaks in the system. And then we introduce the thing and we start, if you introduce any new technology, be it the computer lab, be it Blackboard, uh, whatever it is, we have to do it in small bite sizes. And people run away kicking and screaming, they shout. And so a computer, when it first arrived, was just used as a calculator. And you may remember right now, as we're entering the sort of mobile device area, people are using their mobiles as calculators, more or less. And maybe they're using them as Googling machines. And that's about where it stops. It's hard for us to use them because they are mobile. It's only now 
that some of my staff are beginning to say, but why am I teaching them essentials of Baroque architecture when they're already carrying it around in their pockets? But somehow there's also this disconnect that the learners may be much further ahead than the staff. So, in, so that's the infant, and the infant is the one who, interestingly enough, the infants in the world in which we live are slightly ahead of the grown-ups. No, Daddy, to reset your default, scroll down to preferences and then open the appropriate dialog box. But of course, I'm very worried about this ageism with that sort of stuff, because I found that in the environment in which I worked, which was, uh, I was a, a, a head of a university residence for many years, and I found that education students were incredibly lazy at learning new technology. But as a professor of education, I found that 55-year-old women working in the library were probably the best adopters of the technology. So who's the infant in this position? So one needs to ask that. The infant is the one who says, remember the time when a computer was something on TV from a science fiction show, a window was something you hated to clean, and Ram was the cousin of a goat. When Meg was the name of a girl and Gig was your middle finger upright, and now they all mean different things. And that really mega bites. Memory was something you lost with age. A CD was a bank account. And if you had a three and a half inch floppy, you hope nobody found out. Compress was something you did to the garbage, not something you did to a file. And if you unzipped anything in public, you'd be in jail for a while. Log was adding wood to a fire. A hard drive was a trip down the road. A mouse pad was where a mouse live. And backup happened to your commode. Cut you did with scissors, paste you did with glue. A web was a spider's home and a virus was the flu. Of course, in this country, I believe the virus now is, the virus of choice now is Ebola. Um, I find it amazing that in a country, how many people have you got? 250 million, and you've got one locked up for 21 days. Fascinating. And I guess I'll stick to my pen and paper and the memory in my head. I hear nobody's been killed in a computer crash, but when it happens, they wish they were dead. And now we're going to try something all together, and I'm going to open a poll, and I'm going to ask you to what extent are you actually seeing the technology implementation that you have? Is it A, minimal, in other words, um, almost nothing? Or are you fully in the infant stage? Now, you could be in the infant stage because you're not there yet, or of course, you could be out of the infant stage altogether. So there could be two reasons why you choose almost not um, or fully. So are your people kicking and screaming? Are they still the babies in this stuff or not? Let's see. That's the instant poll, and I'm starting the poll. And now, if you will fill in the bit on your side. Can you see it on your side? This is fun, isn't it? An interactive presentation. And so we've had 12 seconds, 77 users connected, 30 users have answered. Of course, it would have been very easy for me just to tell you by show of hands, but it's hard to show one, two, or three. So anyway, 41 users have chosen, have answered of the 70, 42, 43. This is very cool, ladies and gentlemen. I'm enjoying this. I'm going to tweet about this. 45 users. 46 users. Okay, and while you're doing that, it gives me time to quickly look at time. Can anybody remember what time I'm supposed to stop this? What does the program say? 9.30. 9.45. Oh, there's plenty of time. Good. So let's show the results. We've gone, we've gone for a minute. So 50 of 80 users, and there are our results. And so we know that there are as many people who say they're not in the baby stage yet as there are people who say they are fully in the baby state, and there are about 18 people who are sort of in the B position. Which then, let's end the poll, and let's go to the next slide, which I'm hoping to get there. And then the winding schoolboy. And this is the phase where people buck the system, and this is the phase where we start looking at copying of homework. Uh, we look at plagiarism. And I want to talk a little bit about this plagiarism thing because that is sort of a hot topic. Is it still a hot topic? 
I'm finding it really interesting. Who of you are big Turnitin people? All right. I'm happy to see that the Turnitin people are getting a bit fewer. Um, I read something really interesting the other day which says that Turnitin themselves have this huge database against which they're testing things. So I'm saying exactly if Turnitin takes my essay, copies it onto their server, who's committing some sort of IP violation here just to start off with? Of course, the other thing is my students have learned very quickly, you put anything that you want to copy into Google Translate, translate it into a random language and back, and it'll be, fair, it'll be of such that Turnitin still won't catch it. And my question is why are we giving people tasks that are so easy to copy and paste. And that's simply because between our ears, we are still copying and pasting. Our assignment that we give our students is still the same assignment that we've copied and pasted from all the assignments that we've ever done. It simply means reproduce the first five headings in most of the textbooks. And that's more or less the topic that we give students to write, always. And so obviously they will find some sort of thing, copy and paste into that. What if we tried to do it slightly differently? What if we said to people, listen, instead of writing me an essay about this or that, I would like you to cre create me a spreadsheet about this topic. And in the first column of the spreadsheet, I want you to have the full citation of the site. And how do you get that? You right-click on the site where it says cite this, copy it, and paste it in there. And that's not copyright violation or plagiarism. If you copy the citation, you paste it into the first column. In the second column, give it a rating from one to five in terms of how useful you find that specific site or article that you found. In the third column, paste all its keywords. In the fourth column, Put a sentence in inverted commas that you like best from that and put its page number in brackets. And in the last column, in your own words, say, thir in 30 of your own words, say why we should be using this site. And then you give them a mark for the first 20 sites that they've submitted. Can you see that there's no way that you can commit plagiarism there? You might be able to find one or two of your friends' things, but it won't be their summary, won't be their quote, etc. It's very hard to commit plagiarism there. But then you go one step further, and you teach students a very good skill in Word called mail merge. And then you say to them, what you do is, in author's name out of the spreadsheet, uh, from, from that, uh, in this work, so-and-so says, merge the next bit, about which I feel merge the next bit and run through that entire merge from your highest stars to your lowest stars and you have a thing called the lit review. So the, this phase then is where you do find people compliant, where they are creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. And then, of course, where they also have all sorts of tricks, like this chap who says, cool, I just jammed the air control tower. You have to remind me where you see a little star like that. That's when I'm at the, at the end of one phase and where I then have to run a little poll with you for the next one. So, again, with A being minimal and C being maximum, to what extent are you finding that the technology that you are implementing is in the phase of the whining schoolboy. Are you getting reluctant compliance? And so start the poll. Let's see. We've got 50, 90 users collect, connected. How can there be more users connected than there are people in the audience? This is amazing. Ah, oh, more than one device. Uh, the question is to what extent are, are you seeing um, to what extent are, are, is your environment in the peevish schoolboy, the whining schoolboy system? So are you seeing your people reluctantly complying, or are they fully compliant, in which case it, it's not the... Uh, okay, so to what extent are you in, uh, is your organization in the peevish schoolboy phase? Yeah, we're completely like the peevish schoolboys. 
and zero or A means no, we're not there at all, which either means we're beyond it or we haven't arrived yet. Ladies and gentlemen, while we're doing this, just a little comment on the idea of, of participation in this way. I was working at, uh, speaking at the, uh, a certain university the other day who have an innovative technology by which they make sure that class attendance is monitored. They discovered there's a link between class attendance. In my country, for many years, for political reasons, you were not allowed to make class attendance compulsory uh, because people, students may have trouble traveling there, etc., etc. What we found is there's a very clear link between class attendance and performance. And so now they're wanting to make it compulsory, but they can't. So what they're doing is they're simply making attendance monitoring compulsory. So the lecturer has to make sure that the lecturer knows whether the student was in class or not. If the student wasn't in class, that's a chance the student is taking. And so to this effect, they've made fingerprint machines that they pass through the class, and every student scans her fingerprint in as this thing goes across. And I looked at this, and I thought, you know, is this not overkill in the first place to fingerprint monitor every student in the class? And in the second place, the only evidence that we have is that that finger was in that class. We have no evidence that the brain was there, and we have no evidence of where else the finger may have been. So 56 users have voted, show results. Okay, so this is interesting. Can you see there's a market shift from baby steps um, a whole lot of us are sort of on our way here, and there's a, a clearer majority of people in the peevish school, schoolboy things. So I think the whole, if we look at this audience now, we're saying to ourselves that in terms of technology implementation generally, we seem to be moving along into the peevish schoolboy phase. So I'm going to end the poll, the whining schoolboy, he says. And then the lover. And so the, the lover is the one who will want to put everything into technology. It's been a really interesting thing recently that I've had to speak at schools to say to them, please stop using the technology. Maybe it's a good idea just to look at people. Maybe just chat to them. Maybe just uh, find other ways of communicating with people rather than just wanting to plug them in. And actually, ironically, where, where this brought, was brought home to me very strongly recently was in a doctoral graduate of mine who passed away of cancer a couple of months ago, but she documented her progress on Facebook. And what was interesting was she had done her doctorate with me in computer-based nursing education. And one of her later, very later postings was about how she'd gone to hospital and been monitored and they'd put a thing on her arm to monitor uh, uh, blood pressure, they'd put a thing on her finger, and she said this was the most lonely experience of her life, being monitored by a nurse who did not look her in the eye once. And those of you who went to hospitals to be born like I did and then never again, or maybe once or twice for a checkup or so, will know that period of intimacy when your blood pressure is being taken. There's somebody who's looking at you, not because they, have, because they want to, but at least it looks like care and concern. Now it's a matter of plug in and there you go. And so I'm sometimes worried when the lovers of technology want to fix everything. Um, I put in there the pornographer um, because of cyber sex and dirty teaching. Uh, the, the, it was the, the, one of the, the I, I'd been at a conference where somebody spoke about the religion of computers and education, and he talked with metaphors such as priests and so on, and he then warned against talking about sex, politics, and religion. And he said he would be strong enough to talk about religion, but he couldn't face the other two. And then I took the challenge and said, I'm going to talk about sex. What can teachers learn from pornographers? And actually, it's Tom Malone's four things, challenge, curiosity, control, and fantasy. Those are the things that, that, um, that, that Pornographers use challenge, curiosity, control, and fantasy, and those are the things that Malone has shown that, that educators also use, challenge, control, curiosity, and fantasy. And so the, the lover is the one who will surf for the answer, who will be ahead of you 
and, and so to what extent have we learned to teach ahead of our learners? Uh, to put out certain things, get them to Google for you, get them to come back with those answers even before um, you, and to, and to present you with the newer problems. I think this is something that old Plato said, is he who questions much learns much. And so to what extent are we teaching our students to ask the right questions? Now, there was a student who came to see me recently. Um, he was a multimedia student at my university, and he said he wished that he could just speak to my lecturers and tell them how he learns, because they were just simply wasting his time. They would sit there and teach him to code. He says, in a language that they invented, which was a bad language because he couldn't use it anywhere else. And so what he did was to sit in class, go to codeacademy.com, and teach himself while they were trying to teach the others in class. And he said, can't you just, can't our lecturers just please put on Blackboard what they will be doing in class? Because by the time I've driven to class and back, it's, by the time I get to class, I've already spent $10 worth of fuel to get to class to, to find out that the lecturer is doing catch up and I'm gonna to have to drive back. Makes no sense. And so our learners are able to teach themselves faster than we can teach ourselves. So when at the end of the year there was technology day and they suggested to me that I needed to, to nominate a keynote speaker, I nominated this student. And so what he did was he spoke to the lecturers and he showed them how he Googled for information using plus and minus and inverted commas. Only those three little Boolean operators, a plus and minus and inverted commas, the lecturers were dumbfounded. Oh, they said, we didn't know we could do this with Google. Do all students know this? They asked. No, he said, only intelligent students. How did you get to know this? They asked. I Googled for it, he replied. So, I've got some really cool things here. These are pictures, um, patterns, and it's rather appropriate in this city where um, these type of Victorian patterns are rather, or is it Art Deco, I haven't, Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Victorian, and so on. These things, beautiful little pattern, and that one. Anybody still remember a doily? Um, piece of crocheting. This could be a piece of embroidery. I am hoping that you're looking at the bottom of the screen, though, because what you're seeing at the bottom of the screen is the mathematical formula that you type into a computer to generate this. So those are Julia sets. And if a function maps f a region g onto itself, f can be iterated. The Julia set of f is then the set of all points of g at which this sequence of iterated functions is not equicontaneous. That means absolutely nothing to me. And it is really, really sad to me that if I were to ask somebody what is a Julia set, they'll give me that answer. They will not show me the three pictures that preceded. And that's the really sad thing, that we are able to kill education using definitions. I was in a, a really interesting place about a month ago in uh, the, the Narba de Desert. In the, it, it's called the... Um, Fish River Canyon, it's the second largest canyon after the Grand Canyon. And the question asked there is, why is the canyon shaped, why is it shaped like a snake? And the answer is, because it was a snake that tried to get away from the sand bushman warriors and push the sand that way. Or, it is because a river that flows in a particularly flat bed doesn't really have anywhere to go, and so it spirals. But isn't it fun that somebody actually realized that we may give the folk definition as well? And I rather like the idea that in a tribute to the people, they gave the folk definition first. But it goes more than that. A man called Berko Wilsenach, an artist, downloaded these uh, 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 Julia sets from the internet, put them onto velvet pillows and pushed pins through them and made a work of art uh, with which he won one of the most prestigious youth awards in South Africa that gave him uh, six months in Paris to study his art further. And so that's just the connection between using the computer and using art in the same way. And we all know when we talk about the lover 
Gartner's hype cycle. I just put up one hype cycle here. Gartner brings out a new one every year. What the hype cycle tells you, and you may want to go and look for hype cycles, it tells you that whenever a technology is introduced, it starts at the bottom with the technology trigger. You then get to the peak of inflated expectations, which is where MOOCs were last year. You then fall down the trough of disillusionment, which is where self-grading and self-taught teaching courses are right now. And then you start lifting along the plateau of productivity and the slope, uh, sorry, the slope of maturity to the plateau of productivity. Plateau of productivity is where learner management systems are now. It's simply an ingrained technology. That's what we do. So a hype cycle is a, a very worthwhile little exercise. And the lovers are the ones who say home is where you hang your at, where the email of the species is deadlier than the mail, where a journey of a thousand sites begins with a single click, where you t can't teach an old mouse new clicks, where C is the root of all directories, where one is Pentium wise but pen and paper foolish, where the modem is the message, where too many clicks sp spoil the browse, where the geek shall inherit the earth, where we get ta taught not to bite off more than we can view, where facts is stranger than fiction, where what boots up must come down, where windows will never cease, in gates we trust, virtual reality is its own reward, and there's no place like home.com. And we all know, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him to use the net, and he won't bother you for weeks. Of course, there's another problem, and that is that if you teach a man to fish, he'll sit in a boat drinking all day. So, to what extent are your is your environment and we'll do one to three again and again A is not at all and hey we're a hundred users connected while you're connecting and doing your vote let me continue my story about the finger. So, what I discovered was that if you do a poll like this, then at least you know that the brain was in the class. But what can also happen is that a student could phone his buddy at home and say, listen, he's going through this slideshow, here's the URL of the slideshow, you'd better fill in the poll every so often. Which is absolutely fine. If the student is there and following the slideshow, whether he's following it in class or whether he's following it at home, really makes no difference. And so it becomes a challenge for me to say, if we're actually going to have a session like we're doing today, which is why I'm really sad that none of you have chirped yet. I'm rattling these things. Some of you may want to yell out some stuff um, so that I can give some smarties. But I find it interesting that at conferences, we tend to say to each other, we really need to move away from one person standing in front and the rest doing nothing. Um, I'm still standing in the front, but at least I'm hoping that you're not doing nothing anymore. Um, and at least sometimes when I see you with the screens up, I know you're not reading your emails. Okay, so we have 57 users out of 102 users connected. This is really cool. 59 users have answered. Show results. And interesting, the... the, the group of people who are sort of midway between the two in this phase is now, so we're making a nice normal distribution curve as we go along that most of us who are on midway are in lover phase and then less and then more of us um, are in the um, very, uh, sorry, more of us are not quite there at the lover phase, then many of us are almost there and a few of us are very much there. So let's end the poll and then we go on. And then you get the soldier. And this is where the fighting starts, where we have to have a strat plan or a technology plan. I read something really cool the other day about universities. Ladies and gentlemen, who of you work for universities? Okay, fine. In my country, we make a really interesting distinction between working for a university or being associated with a university. So if you are an associate professor or a full professor, you will indicate to people that you are that by not saying I work for a university, you'll say I'm associated with the university. It's a little snob thing that we do. So those of us who are associated with universities, 
um, have been worried about the technicization of a university. In South Africa, we get told that our university has to grow in its numbers by about 3 to 4 percent per year. Do you have the same sort of idea that you're supposed to grow by about 3 to 4 percent per year? Now, ladies and gentlemen, has anybody who administers universities ever actually bothered to do a tiny little intellectual exercise called think? I train jewelry students. One of, the, one of the groups in my faculty is jewelry design. If you're going to teach jewelry design, you're going to have benches. You need 15 benches, and there are three years, which means you have 45 students. That's how many you can take, because that's how many benches there are. So if the university says you must grow by 10%, where am I going to find the four benches for the four more students who have to come? It just isn't going to work that way. And so I don't quite know why people do that, but I'm, I'm on about strategies at the moment because this is the other thing. We have to do strategic planning once a year, strategic planning. At a university, one does strategic planning if you're in the army. The job of the army is to kill people. And so you have to have a strategy because you have to kill more of them than they kill of you. At a university, the strategy is actually very simple. You get students, you pass students, some of them fall out, some of them graduate. If many of them fall out, then you recruit even more so that it doesn't matter if many of them fall out because you'll still graduate the same. So that's strategy. And you do that year after year after year and then you retire. So that's it. Why do we have to have a two-day breakaway to get to these? The mind boggles. But at any rate, this is where the infighting starts, where we get uh, uh, rules that run the computer laboratory. This laboratory is for this stuff only. This laboratory is for that stuff. This is where the firewall comes up, where um, we have the control measures. We have the computer policy. Um, and I don't know why I said imagine a group of surgeons there, because uh, that, it's just to remind me of the little story that is in Seymour Papert's book, The Children's Machine. Um, he explains that Imagine a group of surgeons of 100 years ago walking into an operating theater today. They wouldn't recognize anything in that operating theater. He says, but if a group of teachers were to walk into a classroom today, they might just carry on with the lesson. But then there's this very strange sort of other side to the same thing. And that's if you think about it. It's those very same teachers with that very limited technology that actually produce those surgeons with all the high tech. So that is interesting for me. But I must say that over the past couple of years, I have noticed a radical shift in the technology use in classrooms. And as we had predicted, those of us who were around 10 years ago and speaking in venues like this one, that radical shift was driven by the kids, not by the teachers. Pete Comers, about three or four years ago, made a presentation called Switch on your mobile phone, the lesson has begun. And that was radical because there were rules against having mobile phones in the country. One of the countries that I visit quite often still has laws ag against having... It's a national law that you may not have a mobile phone in the classroom. It's very scary for me to have to say to my students from that country that their country is legislating against education. So that was the imagine the group of surgeons. But so I brought along two American pieces of money, which I believe are called dimes. And then if I press a button, then they go to the other side and you've witnessed a paradigm shift, <laughs> which is what everybody in education, <laughs> everybody in education is for ever talking about old paradigms and new paradigms, which is all a pot of rubbish. It's this, there's just something called good teaching and bad teaching. And you can do them in various ones. So you will find people who write essays about the old paradigm with passive learners, exam-driven, rote learning, etc., etc., and then the active learners, continuing assessment, etc., etc. Ladies and gentlemen, that's rubbish. I'll give you a little experiment done by a colleague of mine who teaches an online class and decided that continuous assessment is the way to go because he wants to make sure that his learners work 
throughout the semester. And so every Friday, there's a test. And every Friday, they seem to do worse in the test because they seem to think that maybe they'll do better next time. And they get test fatigue as this carries on. His colleague, who teaches the same class, a different subject, runs on the classic approach that we all had, major test mid-semester, mid exam at the end, 60-40 waiting. Her kids do substantially better because they cram all night before the high-stakes test, dump all the stuff, and then relax for the rest of the time, and then cram again and dump the stuff. And they've developed enough schema in here to make that possible. And so, what is the question? Is the old paradigm the better one, or the new paradigm the better one? And somehow or another, if you read Bloom 1972, Automaticity, the Hands and Feet of Genius, he says, unless you can do things automatically, you're not going to get further. And so, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote it in the tipping point, said exactly the same thing. But you know what? Malcolm Gladwell does actually give credit to Bloom 1972 for automaticity, the hands and feet of genius. It's, it's some of those things that, that we, we lose if we realize that people have to have the sub-skills in place. You cannot multiply lies. You cannot divide if you haven't learned your multiplication tables. Please note Cronier's words here. It's not you can't divide if you can't multiply. You can't divide if you haven't learned your multiplication tables. Because multi multiplying is rapid addition. But knowing that five fives are 25 is rote learning. And you cannot do 27 divided by five if you can't guess what is 25 and subtract the two. And you can only guess that if you've wrote learned. You'll see I use the one five because that's the only set of tables I managed to memorize. That's because, because I actually memorized it cognitively because you know that every second one is a five, then it's done. So there are different ways of learning those tables, but without having one in. And so we're still in the soldier mode here and, and looking at the fights that we have. And we ask ourselves, is it really old and new? And the, the guy says, I use the undo command and my mistake disappeared and the pencil says, I've had an undo command on my head for years. So we find that it's very hard for us to decide that technology is old or new. But you'll see something here. Have, you all know those words. What we know, by the way, can you remember? A behaviorist is a teacher you don't like and a constructivist is a teacher you do like. That, that seems to be the only definition that sort of holds, but it actually goes to Socrates and Plato, where Socrates was the one who asked questions and Plato was the one who told. Interestingly enough, who was the younger one there? The new way was Plato's way, not Socrates' way. And so people talk of a pendulum, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and see if we can do a paradigm shift away from the pendulum as well. Um, because it goes even before Socrates and Plato, it goes to the time of the Greek gods, to the time of Prometheus and Epimetheus. And Prometheus, you will remember, was the man who stole from Zeus the ability to make fire and taught it to man. He was the positivist, he was the instructivist, he was the behaviorist, he was the choleric with the liver, can you remember? Because there's a picture of Prometheus with the um, crows hacking away at his liver. Can you remember that was his punishment? He, um, he was the choleric, the one with the liver, and he was punished that way. But so Prometheus was the one who thought ahead. He was the behaviorist. Epimetheus, the reflective practitioner, was his brother. He was the one who was into poetry, into the creative arts, um, and he was the constructivist. He was the relativist. And he was punished for his crime, please do not turn up the page, by getting a wife. And there are smarties for anybody who can, can guess who the wife is with whom the gods punished Prometheus. Come, be brave. I've got smarties, people. He said Pandora. Okay. Did he cheat? Did you? No, I didn't. Oh, he didn't. Okay. Just checking. I wrote a paper about it. I mean, oh, very good. Then you can share with him. Don't give him all of it. Just share. Pay commission. Right. 
And the wife of Prometheus was curiosity herself, Pandora. And what one remembers is that when all the evil, re and you see, this is where the fun comes in. We're so busy trying to teach students everything. We don't want them to be curious. We tell them about the horrors that happened when Pandora opened the box to try and find out what's going on inside there. And what we forget is that what remained was hope. And so, I, I, okay, let's do a poll quickly. So this is the soldier. So to what extent are you beginning to see the soldier? Uh, to what extent? And we go multiple choice, and we start the poll. We are now at 106 users, and we're voting incredibly quickly. So, so the soldiers are the militant ones where we start debating vigorously. I must be careful about influencing the vote here, so I'll just be quiet. Voting is coming in fast and furious. We have 39 answers. 41. 106 users connected. Ah, oh. <laughs> very good. That's worth a smarty or two. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It takes a bit of time to get an interaction into an audience. Technology is helping, but this is very good technology. Do you know how seldom I manage to finish a box of Smarties during a presentation? Okay, so let's show the results. Aha! And so we're seeing quite a big shift again towards the... I, we're almost going to have a sort of a Gartner hype cycle, it would seem to me, because there are more soldiers than any of the others we've had so far. And so then we need to start looking at the justice. And the justice is the evaluator. And, um, oh, I forgot to say that uh, Tom Reeves sent his regrets that he couldn't be here. And I would like to acknowledge Tom in this presentation. Uh, and so when we talk about evaluation, that's, he's the guy from whom I learned everything I, knew, I know about evaluation, but I only know a very tiny bit of what he knows. But, so it's here where we start asking the hard questions about technology, where we start asking whether we are actually evaluating on higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And we start looking at what technologies are we using to make those evaluations happen. And then also looking at Kirkpatrick's levels. Uh, we all know Bloom, and we know the new one that says creativity sits at the top, which is rather fun. Um, and then those of you who uh, have forgotten Kirkpatrick, he's the one who says at the bottom level we have the smilometer. and says, was the seats, were the seats, go, uh, use, were the seats comfortable and was the food good? Um, running to, did learning actually take place? And this is a question that I find interesting, that we at university... We do not evaluate at the second level of, of Kirkpatrick's taxonomy. We're assuming the student walks in with nil and that everything that student learned, we taught them. Because if you're going to, do, to test learning, you do pre-test, post-test, you subtract between the two and the difference of that is learning. And somehow or another, we just measure whether students have managed to get the, the course outcomes. It's, it's madness. And then after learning, we're saying, well, okay, and is behavior, has there been demonstrable behavior change? In my country, we're very bad at that because we seem to have a very good pass rate in our driver's license tests. And our driver's license uh, exams are quite rigorous. They, they sort of suggest that you stop at red traffic lights and not just slow down and check whether there's, et cetera. But once drivers have that license, it seems that they have a license to kill rather than to drive. So, so there's a disconnect between what the test says and what actually happens. Um, and that's what Kirkpatrick talks about. And then finally, at the top level, there is the, the, um, the one of impact. 
does the world or does the environment work differently? Now, very often we find we had some work where they did some training. Well, one which works really well um, was the South African Airways cabin crew training. They had a very clear indicator for when cabin crew training was necessary, and that's when complaint calls reached a certain level. So they simply had a graph, and if customer complaints hit a certain spot, the Plato system in those days kicked in, cabin crew got retrained, and down came the complaints. And so it was a very simple way to see whether that training actually had impact. There was a one-to-one -one relationship to that. And so that's what we mean when we talk about the justice. And I'm reminding you about tweeting to ELEARN 2014 or at Johannes Grenier. And I'm also say I need to advertise some stuff. So if you Google for Johannes Grenier, one word, then you'll get to my site. I should have given you the beginning of that. So you just go Johannes Grenier. And I've got two. I've got Blogspot and I've got the Google site. And if you go to the Google site, um, I'm just showing you this because you might find some stuff quite useful. Uh, so if you go up there, you have a thing called My Free Online Doctoral Program. And so this is a thing, you've all heard about a thing called a MOOC, which is a massive open online course. Now this is also a MOOC. It is a mini open online course. I was teaching a group of students and I kept on telling the same stuff to the same students. And I kept on finding them Googling the same information. I thought, what the hell? Why don't I, instead of saying the same stuff to them, why don't I just put it on a website? And so if you click on my free online doctoral program over here, then you will get to my free online doctoral program. And it says before you start, this is the sort of stuff you have to do. Get Mendeley so that you can cite properly, get to know your word processor, um, download Harzings, Publish or Perish, or Google Scholar so you can figure out whether people you're citing are the right sort of people. Um, make sure that you, oh yes, then the next thing to do, meet your heroes, find out who the great names are in your field, meet them on researchgate.net and academia.edu, and then make a table of the type that I showed you, giving what are the issues and key issues and begin with the end in mind, then I talk about the draft proposal, and so it carries on and on and on, and by that time, that's when you hand in, and uh, it tells you how to write chapter one, two, and three, and then, and chapter five. I haven't figured out chapter four yet, when I do that, it'll come in there. So, there is my free online doctoral program. Another thing that I've got here is a thing that a student of mine, Johan Yun, made many years ago called the who's who of technology in education. And, I managed to resurrect this who's who in technology and education, but I'm thinking that I must make a new one. So if you click on, my, on um, the Johannes Grenier site, there, no, the who's who. And there is another video of me doing this one, so you can see if I've done it the same. There's another one of my, of, if you click there, you'll go to the who's who. And the old who's who, looked sort of like this. Um, and I'm trying to resurrect it. So if you think that you are part of the who's who in computers and education, fill that in. And one day when I have a bit of time, I'll actually put it in. Now, I'm not going to go any more to that. I'm going to go on with um, the presentation, for which I still have a little bit of time, I think. You said 45. So we've got 10 minutes. We'll do it. And so when we talk about the justice, we know that there are many one very useful feature that most computers give us, which is the one called drag and drop. So to come back with the justice, um, I must go one slide back. In terms of the justice, we have to decide which way are we going. This is quite fun. This is uh, an indication to a site, to a, a, a town called Katima Mulilu. And you can decide whether you want to go the gravel road, which is substantially shorter but considerably rougher, or whether you want to go the tar road, which you'll probably make it, but it'll take you a little bit longer. So those are the questions that we ask ourselves. This is the, qu the question that I get asked more often than anything else, is do we go Blackboard or Moodle? And then I reply by, do I care? So if we're going to say, talk about instructivism and 
cognit or constructivism, where instructivism is about how to put knowledge across, constructivism is about how we learn. So actually, they are not opposites. They would cross purposes. And so we can't plot them at 180 degrees. We tend to say there's objectivism this side and constructivism this side. I'm saying, no, actually, there isn't. There is naught at the bottom here, or which way are we going? There. There's naught over there, which means there was no overt planning, and there was, it's, it's, it's just where you have no behaviorism, no constructivism over here. Then we have an axis for behaviorism and an axis for constructivism. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are academics, whenever you find two of things, two dimensions of sorts, rejoice, because all you have to do is plot them at 45 degrees, and then you get, at least plot them at 90 degrees to each other, Make, and then you get the matrix. And the matrix is a really cool thing, because you've got two dimensions, objectivism, constructivism, or whatever you've got, you plot them at right angles, you've got four quadrants. You write one paragraph on each one of those four quadrants, you've got a publication. And so here are my four quadrants. And at the top there, you see 100% objectivism. And that is the drill and, uh, what do they call it, drill and practice quadrant. And that's, as I said to you, the purpose of that type of education, drill and practice type of education, is if you need for some reason to bypass the brain. It's to get to automaticity and to go back to the army that's why the main way in which a, an army works is by drill and practice. Because if you were to say to a soldier, in the trench over there is a perfectly decent guy with a wife and kids like yourself who doesn't want to be there, but do you mind going there and killing him quickly? Soldier's not going to do that. Instead of which you say to him, if you see somebody who is no, not dressed like you, dash down, crawl, observe, sights, fire. And that's how you do it. You bypass the brain and things happen. So that's the instruction quadrant. Then you have the construction quadrant, where to me the, the best way, the best example of the construction quadrant is the sort of stuff that Seymour Papert talked about when he coined the phrase constructionism rather than constructivism, where you give somebody something to do, and when they finish doing it, you know that they can do all the outcomes. So, an exor the exercise I gave with the spreadsheet. Let me give you another example. Instead of saying to a student, learn off by heart this textbook and then come to class and give me the main headings of the first five chapters. Instead of which, we say to a student, make me a spreadsheet where you ask 20 questions with radio buttons to select yes, no, that are based on the, okay, obstruct objectivism, constructivism, good idea. Make me a spreadsheet with which you can test whether a given learning event was made according to constructivist or instructivist positions or both. So make me a test where you could have 20 questions along this axis, 20 questions along that axis with radio buttons in there. For a student to be able to do that, he's got to read everything about constructivism, reduce it into 20 questions, learn how to type it into a spreadsheet, learn how to make radio buttons, learn how, etc. How long does it take you to mark a thing like that? As long as it does to look at it. Simply open it. How do I mark things? I have a, I have a, a um, what do they call those things? A filing system that says 10, 20, no it doesn't. It starts with 50 because no student ever fails with me. They get, they get non-complete or at least a 50. So there's 50, 60, 70, 80, 100. Those are my grades. And then I take, the, I open that file. I think this is really cool, um, which means it gets a 70. I think this absolutely knocks my socks off, in which case it gets a 100, or anywhere in between. I simply drop them into those uh, um, folders, make a printout, because the students send it to me as S for spreadsheet and your student number. So I drop it into that folder, arrange it by numerically, make a printout of that, and there's my mark sheet. And it's as simple as that to mark. So um, there are ways around this, but it's a constructionist because the very fact that the student has actually made the spreadsheet is proof that the student has mastered the content. Um, then you get the chaos qu quadrant. And one would argue that in the chaos quadrant, no learning happens. Well, in fact, in fact, 
most of our learning happens in the chaos quadrant. It's the serendipitous learning. It's when you, I've just been driving on the wrong side of the road all the way from Atlanta. It was really scary. Um, not for me, but for the people around me. <laughs> because I don't know why you Americans have this hard island in the middle of the road. So when I turn this way, that's the short turn. But in your country, that's the long turn. But that's inconvenient if you're sort of 100 meters down and cars start coming from the front and now there's a constructed island in the middle. And so in that chaos quadrant, I learned probably the best lesson I've ever learned and that is that the white line must be closest to the steering wheel. As long as you know that, you can drive, doesn't matter in which country, just make sure that the white line and the steering wheel are close together. But then, do not take those off-ramps from the highway where you get to the McDonald's and the Steers and all those things because they don't have white lines there. So you have to wait until some other American drives past and then follow them. <laughs> and that's all the sort of learning that happens in chaos. And then you have the integration quadrant where we say to ourselves, as wanting to teach these kids to divide, I've got to give them so many hours worth of memorizing tables 1 to 12. Why do we do tables 1 to 12? Did anybody, has anybody ever figured that one out? Well, let me tell you why we do tables 1 to 12. Because in, before the 1960s, the British currency system worked in threes. And so to be able to calculate your money in Britain, you had to use pounds, shillings, and pence, and they worked in a, a units of 12. And so you had to know your tables of 1 to 12. Then we metricated, nobody ever told the teachers that, so we still learn tables 1 to 12. It's... Right, so we're going to do something different this time. I'd like you to just press with your hand on anywhere here where, you're, where you think your way of teaching actually is. Are you, do you do 100% of instruction? Do you do 100% of construction? Or are you somewhere in the integration quadrant? You just have to click on that, and then as we click on that, so we will see where you are clicking. So this is fun, isn't it? There we can see. Come, let's have some more clicks. Now, this is interesting. Um, how this clicking system works is that I'm going to switch this off again because otherwise you're not clicking. So I'd like you to go and click there. Um, now, what, what happens is... Now, I don't want to give the game away because otherwise you'll all vote in the same place. So, research. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes really brilliant things happen. I, I wrote a paper in ETR&D about this four-quadrant model. And based on that, a man called Kelly Ellender emailed me and said, could he do a doctorate in which he could test this? And so he tested it over 140 universities with a couple of thousand instructional designers and said to them, answer paired questions about your teaching and tell us, and, and then he worked out from that. So his hypothesis was, if people teach either in an instructivist or a constructivist way, then the, the, the bullets would be all along the side there. So all the instructivists would be there, and all the constructivists would be there. That's if you teach either one or the other. If you teach in an integrated way, then the bullets would be somewhere sort of around here. And interestingly enough, he tested, did a pilot test with about 40 um, people, and he found a sort of a, a thing around here. And then he did it with 1,400 respondents, and indeed, he found the same thing. And then I had to, I was his external examiner or co-supervisor, I don't know what you call us people, and I had to attend his, his uh, doctoral defense, where then, then he said, and luckily, I found this to be true. And I said, no, 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 no. You can't say luckily. I'm very happy that you found it to be true, but as a researcher, to you, it's, ni it's neither here nor there. You either say, well done, Cronier is on to something, or you can say, I have shown Cronier to be a total idiot, but for you, as a researcher, that's what it is. Fortunately for him, he has shown Cronier to be, well, he's shown nothing about Cronier, he just showed that Cronier's theory seems to hold. And so let's have a look at the results in this room. And this is very interesting how you've moderated yourself to the middle. The, the redder the shape becomes, uh, the more um, people voted for that specific shape. But what is interesting is that the, in this case, it's pretty much along the lines of Ellender's. He also has this here. 
he doesn't have so many integrations, extreme integrations there. Um, and he has more constructions there. The construction seems to be a little bit more there. But I guess we're a little bit further down the line. Ellender's research was about three years ago, and I guess that we, are, we have the tools and equipment now with which we could actually move a little bit further on. So that's fun. Thank you for that bit of voting. And so part of the judging we also do is that we have to judge the various strategies. Are we going to do classrooms or laboratories? How do we select staff? How do we do our interviews? And I'm now over time. I couldn't believe it. And we do retirement plans for old equipment and letting go. I'm going to run through and look at um, the various models that we could look at. What is a school? Um, and then finally, we have second childishness or mere oblivion, where the, com where the computers are transparent. We don't even know that they are there. And in such schools, that's where learners learn by doing and produce their own materials, where schools develop their own software, where we have computers across the curriculum. And one thing that I find that winning schools have in common is that they focus on girls. I've had the most amazing experiences now recently where I've just seen what happens if you expose any new technology, even if it's just my little convertible motor car, to a group of school kids. The boys rush in play with it, and it's only when they've lost the tension that the girls are allowed to come there. We can't work in a world like this. We've got to work in a world that you tell the boys to line up in the queue and you let the girls go first. This is what winning schools do. They actually have ways of strategizing, and of course, they all have future plans. The future plans, what I find is that schools, you, at least governors of a university, have a vision and strategy, and they have the balanced scorecard, financial, internal perspectives, external perspectives, customer perspectives, learning and growth always at the bottom and money at the top. Interesting. We, however, as educators, have analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. And it's very interesting to see what happens if you superimpose the two. Then we look at the what the finance people tell us, what the internal perspectives are, and we do an analysis. Once we know what the perspectives are, we design to learn. Once we've learned, we grow to service the customer and we evaluate to see if it's been worth the money. Ladies and gentlemen, when we have future plans, what we will know is that thanks to Moore's law, technology will always get smaller and smaller and smaller. And what we also know is that that doesn't go only for computer technology. And that's me. <laughs>